Good morning, everyone. I'm wondering if uh, we should just get started here. Um, there are, uh, I thank you, everybody, for uh, clicking over from the uh, GoToMeeting site. We realized quite quickly that uh, the GoToMeeting site wasn't going to be adequate enough to hold everybody who is coming in, and I'll go over and I'll make an announcement on that site uh, here in just a moment. But I wanted to uh, not delay anything further because we want to hear from, certainly hear from uh, Dr. Mewson. Uh, we want to be able to hear from uh, uh, Dr. Bourne um, and, and others, so uh, we want to get things underway. Uh, without uh, uh, further ado, I'm curious if Michelle Dunn would like to uh, make any sort of announcements before we begin? No, I think um, we're ready to begin. Fantastic. So uh, I think we'll uh, just turn things over to uh, Dr. Mark Mewson from Stanford University, who's going to be speaking on the introduction to big data and the data life cycle. Um, if uh, Dr. Bourne is available, though, beforehand, perhaps that's how we want to begin? Yep, I'm here. Um, thanks, Jack. Let me just say a couple of things. So uh, welcome to the, the first lecture in the Big Data to Knowledge Fundamentals and Data Science Series. It's clearly very exciting. We've got uh, a, a large a virtual turnout. Uh, I guess I would say, I'd have to say good day because I don't know where, what time zone you're in and where you're coming from. But uh, thank you for joining us. I think this is uh, already we see is going to be a very successful uh, initiative. So I'm the uh, Associate Director for Data Science at the National Institutes of Health uh, and I coordinate the big uh, data to knowledge initiative. Um, we put together this program uh, of a series of lectures that sort of collectively cover data science. And clearly, there's a lot of interest in this. Um, and they're going to occur once a week for the next nine months. So uh, you know, hopefully, you already, if you're on this, presumably you have a schedule, a schedule already. Uh, before I introduce Mark, I just wanted to thank uh, Jack and the Training Coordination Center for taking the lead in organizing this series. And uh, Michelle Dunn and, and our own office is uh, stellar at putting these things together and, and getting things going. And so it's a joint collaboration between uh, the Training Coordination Center, the Center's Coordination Center, and the NIH. So uh, let me uh, now quickly introduce Mark. I won't give him a long introduction, although he, he deserves one, but he's, he's the kind of guy who will be happy with a short one. Uh, and thank you, for Mark, for setting the stage for the whole series, and also, of course, for being involved in the planning of the series. That's, that's really much appreciated. Um, I've known Mark for a long time, and he's done some really stellar work, and I'm not going to go into all the detail, but let me just quickly say, uh, he's currently a professor of biomedical informatics at Stanford, as well as the director of the Stanford Center for Biomedical uh, Informatics Research. Um, his, re his research covers a lot of areas, uh, notably intelligent systems, reusable ontologies, metadata for data publication, um, biomedical decision support. Uh, he's been recognized in, in various ways, including the recipient of the Donald uh, Lindbergh Award for Innovation Informatics from the American Medical Informatics Association, uh, elected to the American College of Medical Informatics uh, and the Association of American Physicians, and is a founding co-editor-in-chief of the journal Applied Ontology. So, Mark, uh, thank you for agreeing to kick this off. Uh, we're all very much looking forward to what you have to say. Thanks again. And thank you, Phil. I'm really grateful. Uh, this is rather an awesome responsibility to give the first lecture in this series. And I'm actually very excited to do so because I think the, the lectures that will follow me will be even perhaps more, more interesting than this general overview. But I think it's very important to sort of frame what we'll be doing over the next few weeks and to give you a general introduction to data science and, and where we are heading and where the field is heading. Uh, so as you know, this is the first lecture of a whole series that's been put together uh, by the BD2K Training Coordinating Center with help from uh, the Center's Coordinating Center, from NIH staff, and, and with a little bit of help from me. And we're very, very excited to be able to give you a whole series of, of, of lectures in data science that will obviously be very exciting this quarter and then will continue through the rest of the year. What I want to do this morning is to foreshadow a lot of the things that you'll hear about from the other speakers and to give you a sense for why there's so much excitement about data science and why this field is, is, is so important. And it clearly is important because the world is changing. We think in terms of data in ways which we probably never did before. We used to think of data as sort of the side effects of scientific research. And now we recognize that data are 
are first class entities of themselves that also require careful consideration, careful thought, careful planning. And what I want to do this morning is to give you a sense for what some of that planning needs to be in order to get the most out of the kinds of data that are acquired as a consequence of scientific investigation. A lot of stuff is floating around the web about how the world is changing because of data. Uh, there was a recent uh, piece on PBS that made claims such as all the data processing we did in the last two years is more than all the data processing we did in the last 3,000 years. Or we are now being exposed to as much information in a single day as our 15th century ancestors were exposed to in their entire lifetime. And every two days, the human race is now generating as much data as we as were generated from the dawn of humanity through the year of 2003. The year 2003. These, these are obviously breathtaking sentences. Uh, frankly, no one quite knows where are the data that support these particular sentences, but it gives you a sense for why the world is recognizing that the onslaught of information around us clearly is changing the way we live qualitatively. And in biomedicine, we have the onset of the genomics revolution, which has led to more data than anyone could ever imagine. In clinical medicine, we have the advent of electronic health records, whose data are now being mined in all kinds of ways, and where we recognize that we may not always have the skills that we need in order to appreciate the kinds of information that are, that are coming around us in, in, in biomedicine. The term big data, of course, is, is what's on everyone's lips, and at the same time, it's a word that has a lot of overload, has a lot of associations made with it. I'm not going to try to define big data intentionally. I think that's kind of hard to do, but it's very easy to describe it in terms of its characteristics, and the three that are often mentioned are the idea of data volume, just a lot of data, velocity, the way in which data comes at us very quickly, and variety, the heterogeneity of the data that, uh, that we're acquiring. And to that, people will often add uh, the idea that there's a question of veracity. We get lots of data. We don't always know the truth value of the data that we, that we receive. And um, volume is not what I meant to say here, but uh, um, yes, I will remember what the fifth V is later. Um, this is just a slide from IBM trying to sort of summarize what they believe being the way in which they view big data. And I, th I think it's important not to necessarily look at all of the examples that they give on their slide, but to make it clear how much the big data revolution is affecting not only what we do in science, but also what's happening in industry. And we see that throughout society, there's this increasing uh, desire to be able to identify where data are coming from, to deal with data, and to be able to prepare for the fact that in the future the amount of data we deal with will even be, will even be greater. And although it's easy to think about big data and emphasize the word big and think about quantitative differences, I think what makes, us, uh, what makes things important in data science is the recognition that data, because of the way they are changing our world, are affecting things qualitatively. Suddenly we're in a situation where our servers no more, longer can store all the data that we used to store in a single place, and we have to think about new, new, new solutions, both in terms of hardware and the kinds of uh, data systems that those hardware support. We have to think about new algorithms, because we suddenly can't process data in one, in one, in one sitting. We suddenly have to recognize that because of the volume and velocity and everything else about the data, we need to have algorithms that can keep up with them. And probably most important, uh, although not, not something that gets a lot of press, is that we're moving into an era where we can't get our arms around the data. We can't look at the data. We can't really understand intuitively what the data all mean. And so there's a need to be able to deal with the fact that our cognitive ability is strained, because without the ability to deal with the visualization of data and to get an intuitive understanding of data, we often have to go purely on the basis of our algorithms, which obviously limits our ability to develop uh, intuition about the work that we're doing. Um, this is a slide that was generated by, by Forrester Research, trying to identify what are all the various technologies uh, that are required to manage the data revolution. I'm not going to go through this slide in detail because, frankly, a lot of the stuff that's on the slide is going to be handled in the talks that you're going to be hearing in this series coming up. 
But I think what's important to emphasize from this slide is the fact that uh, Forrester believes we've had significant success in a lot of the infrastructure needed to manage big data. And what's interesting is that all of this big success has happened very rapidly and the time to reach the next phase, whatever that next phase might be in each one of these areas, is not that long. And so, as far as the infrastructure is concerned, Forrester would argue that we're making progress. And certainly when it comes to biomedicine, NIH recognized a couple of years ago the importance of addressing the big data challenges that are uh, facing us in biomedicine. And as you know, the uh, creation of the Big Data to Knowledge Initiative and this seminar series, which is part of that initiative, uh, has been a major uh, undertaking on the part of the NIH to be able to move biology and medicine into, into the next era. And so I think there's a lot of excitement, there's a lot of hype. Uh, but there's also a lot of progress that's being made in this area, and that's obviously the important uh, uh, stuff that we'll be talking about in, in this seminar. What I want to do this morning is to begin with a story. And my story basically is that of a colleague of mine, uh, Pravesh Khatri, who is a faculty member at Stanford and who describes himself as a data parasite. And I think it's important to give you a sense for the kind of work that Pravesh does because I think it motivates a lot of our concerns about data and the data life cycle, which I'll, I'll be getting to later in the, in, in the hour. So Pravesh is mainly concerned about functional genomics data. He knows that out there are all kinds of microarray data that can be very useful in understanding how genes get turned on and turned off in response to various uh, biological signals. And he knows that all of the data that correspond to those kinds of experiments that are uh, at least performed in the United States are available through the NCBI's Gene Expression Omnibus, or GEO. Go out to uh, GEO, and in this large database, you'll be able to find information about basically every microarray experiment that's ever been done. And Pravesh goes out to GEO with the express desire to understand what he can learn from the data that had been collected by other investigators and deposited in the GEO data repository. So Khatri basically is building his career about studying other people's data. And basically what that means is looking at the publicly available data that are out there on the web in order to understand what are the different kinds of experimental conditions that investigators are considering, what kind of real-world heterogeneity might, might, might enter into their data sets, and recognizing that he can do all this without having to perform his own experiments. So there's really no experimental cost, at least in terms of the initial uh, data collection. He can look at human samples, and he doesn't have to worry about IRB approval because that's already been done. And what Khatri has done is to create a pipeline that allows him to search for data sets in GEO, to look for genomic signals, to confirm those signals in validation data sets, and then to confirm what he sees in those, uh, uh, in, rather to elucidate those genomic general, general signals in a, in, a, in a test set, and then to confirm those signals in validation uh, data sets. And what this allows him to do is to see if he can infer information from existing microarray studies that may not have been considered by the investigators who did those studies in the first place, but where he can make discoveries on the existing data sets without ever having to perform an initial experiment. And so the outline of that uh, flow of, of, of work is shown on the right-hand side of this slide. And he's, he's demonstrated the value of, of this approach in a wide range of areas. One that's gotten a lot of press lately is that of diagnosis of sepsis. So sepsis is basically a response to infection in the body that uh, can be very difficult to detect at first. It can be confused with lots of other common kinds of abnormalities that occur in hospitalized patients. Usually it's a response to infection in the blood, but it, there can be lots of non-infectious causes of inflammation that can look a lot like sepsis as well. And so coming up with this diagnosis is obviously critical because unless you make this diagnosis and treat the underlying infection, patients die. And what Pravesh has done is to go out to GEO, the Gene Expression Omnibus, looking at functional genomics data with a clinical question. Are there changes in gene expression that can predict the advent of sepsis? And Pravesh has gone out there, found uh, uh, some uh, sample data, some validation data, uh, looking at his initial samples, he had looked at nine cohorts with 663 samples, identified 
candidate genes, 82 candidate genes, that might be suggestive of the onset of sepsis and ultimately validated 11 genes which showed to be important both in his, his uh, test set and, and, his, and, his, and his validation set. And when he looks at those genes, he shows really phenomenal ROC curves that show that these genes are very, very sensitive uh, and get turned on when sepsis is imminent. And he can show an effect where with uh, the advent of sepsis, with each passing day, those genes get turned on to even greater degrees. I'm not going to go into the details of Prevesh's numbers, but they're just absolutely exciting because this is a way of trying to identify a new way of diagnosing a medical condition but purely on the basis of other people's data stored in a public repository. And Pravesh has taken this approach and applied it to not only the, the diagnosis of incipient sepsis, but also the diagnosis of tuberculosis uh, and distinguishing active TB from a uh, disease that is burned out, which is actually very hard to do clinically, uh, distinguishing viral respiratory infection from bacterial respiratory infection, uh, another very important clinical challenge that usually results in a lot of over-medication of patients with, with, with antibiotics that can be avoided if one knows that something is viral from the beginning. He's used the same approach to identify rejection of organ transplants, another difficult diagnostic problem in clinical medicine. All of these challenges are really tough to do clinically but can be addressed easily by looking at changes in gene expression. And the most exciting thing about this whole adventure that Pravesh has been uh, under, undergoing is that he's never touched a pipette. He's never had to kill a mouse. He's never actually had to do the experiments that lead to those data because the people who have done the experiments have been very cognizant of what's needed in order to make their data not only valuable for the experiments that they are planning, but also valuable for the future of scientific work. So you can be a data parasite like Pravesh Khatri only if the data that you might want to find are in some public repository that are findable through some sort of a search facility that you can find in some, in some standard format that you can parse and, 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 and compute with. And most important if the data themselves are self-describing so that you know how to make sense of the data. They're not just a bunch of columns of information, but rather they actually can describe themselves to understand what the columns mean and you can make sense of those columns. And that the, the product of careful planning, organization, and stewardship, and they're basically created in a way where the data themselves are intended to be reused and to outlive the experiment for which they were collected. And I guess that's the key thing. Because in the old school of thought, we might think of data as being the side effects of our experiment. We publish our paper, and the paper that we publish is a result of our research. And I think currently the, the, the tide is shifting, and we're thinking about the data themselves as being the output of our investigation. And we think about data as having a life cycle. Um, a life cycle that starts with the idea of planning what we're going to do with the data, collecting the data, performing quality assurance on the data, describing those data so that we understand what the data are about, preserving them in an archive, making sure that it's possible for other people to discover those data, to integrate those data with, with other data that they might have available, to perform new kinds of analyses that might lead to new insights that might cause us to do new kinds of experiments which themselves will require us to begin this life cycle again, to plan experiments, to collect data, to perform QA, and so on. We've moved into a, into a world, basically, where the experiment begins not with the de definition of the protocol that we're going to follow as much as the definition of the plan for data management that will be necessary in order to perform the protocol and make sure that the data themselves outlive the experiment that we're planning. And so we, what I want to do is sort of follow us allow us to follow this data uh, life cycle and get a sense of what these various steps are, emphasizing that each one of these steps is going to be the subject of a talk you'll hear about later in this uh, colloquium series. Let me start by saying that one begins with plans. And the plans, uh, the data management plans that guide our work basically are required now by almost every funding agency because of executive orders. At the NIH, if you have a project that uh, 
involves more than $500,000 uh, of direct costs every year, you must have a data management plan. If you deal with genomic or sequence data, then you must have a data management plan. And frankly, if you're smart, you're going to have a data management plan. Because the data management plan saves lots of time and effort down the road by making sure we know what we're going to do with the data when we get them. Most important, uh, they enhance the durability and the long-term value of the data so that investigators like Privesh can find these data later and identify even new kinds of inferences that can come from those data. As I said, they're required by sponsors. Unfortunately, although the data plans are required, they're almost never reviewed uh, as, a, as a consequence of peer review, at least at this point. That may change. But right now, the requirement is that the data plan exists, not necessarily that it's satisfied uh, the criteria of peer review. Uh, but it's there, and frankly, in the best projects, the data plan is not created once at the start, but rather is revisited and updated throughout the project so that we can make sure that we're dealing with data appropriately. That data plan requires us to be thinking about what is the project they're actually doing, what are the existing data that may already be available that we want to be able to consider in our experiments? What are the new data that we're going to be ge generating? What are the methods and the instruments for the data collection? Uh, if we collect the data, how do we organize them? What is the data storage format? What are the structures? Uh, what, uh, what, is the, what is the mechanism by which we're going to store the data? Uh, what permissions do we need to allow people to access the data? Are we going to back up the data? Hopefully, uh, how often will we back up and how? What kind of data scrubbing or quality assurance do we anticipate? What are the administrative, legal, and ethical concerns? Are we dealing with human subjects data? How are we going to protect human subjects? How do we archive and publish our data? What are the responsibilities and duties of the various project members who are going to be contributing to the data? And what are the costs and resources that we need to do this experiment? Um, lots of stuff. It's a little bit daunting. Uh, the good news is that there are open source tools that are readily available, this one called DMP tool that almost all research universities seem to be using. And there are lots of easy ways for basically using templates to create data management plans and to make sure that they're available with the proposals that we submit even before we begin to do experimentation. And at the same time, because these are available and, and easily editable, they allow us to make sure that our, our, our data management plans evolve as we recognize additional complications as, as experiments get performed. So then we collect the data. And collecting the data you know, it can be done in a gazillion different ways because, frankly, there are a gazillion kinds of data. Uh, and so our data management plan provides the guidance that allows us to understand how to deal with the data that we're, we're collecting. Are those data going to be coming from laboratory observations? Are they going to be coming directly from instruments? Are they coming from surveys that we may administer to human subjects? Are they coming from uh, continuous uh, electronic signals? Are they coming from discrete uh, values such as microarray chips? I mean, all kinds of uh, data are used in biomedicine, and we have to understand how to get them in one place so that we can begin to analyze them. Um, the de data may also not be coming from de novo experimentation, but as I showed in the case of the kind of work that Pravesh Khatri does, they may come from online repositories. So our collection of data may not come from direct experimentation, but from gathering data from the publicly available data sets that other investigators have put online. And sometimes if we're dealing with meta-analyses or systematic reviews, we may be getting data not from actual data sets, but from other publications and amassing the publications themselves in order to perform our work. Now, uh, on September 30th, uh, uh, we're going to have a talk on data uh, curation by Pascal Gaudet. Uh, on, on November 4th, uh, we're going to hear about data warehousing from Chaitan Baru. So be prepared for all kinds of talks coming up that will deal with these kinds of aspects of, uh, of the data life cycle. Quality assurance is sort of the next step in, the, in, in that life cycle. Sometimes people call it data scrubbing. And it is actually uh, a science in and of itself. Uh, uh, Joe Pacone will give a talk on this on, on December 2nd. We'll talk about how to double check uh, the values of data that are entered by hand, how to identify data that may have quality problems that need to get flagged, how we can use statistics to understand where we might have data outliers, how we can identify where data might be impossible, uh, 
how we can identify missing data and maybe correct the values uh, uh, for, uh, for uh, missing data or impute, new vet, impute replacements, how to deal with those outliers. How, basically, there's a whole science, if you will, to dealing with the fact that our data are usually uh, full of errors. And before we actually make data publicly available and apply uh, our own investigative techniques to those data, there are things that we need to do in order to make sure that the data are going to meet our expectations and be reliable for our own use. So we plan our data uh, um, overall, our data, data, data management overall. We collect the data. We perform quality assurance and scrubbing. Um, and then we're in a situation where we need to describe the data. Uh, so we can't just have data and stick it in a drawer. We have to be able to recognize that we need metadata. And as Jason Scott says, metadata is a love note to the future. It's our ability to describe data so that down the road we can figure out what we did and we can make sure that other people who may want to think about data or think about our data know what is in the data and how to, how to make sense of those data. So metadata describe lots and lots of different things. They describe the digital content. So what are the, the actual properties of the files themselves that store the data? They provide a mechanism for clarifying who are the investigators and who are the stakeholders who care about this data. Uh, what is the scientific context? So basically, why was the experiment done? What were the data that were actually collected? What were the methods that were applied? What instruments were used to acquire the data? Um, not only the kind of instrument, but actually what the physical instrument. What, what actual serial number was used? In it? What, 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 serial, what was the serial number of the instrument used? Uh, when and where were the data collected? And basically, what are the parameters of the data? Lot, lots of stuff. Uh, these, I should mention that this list of metadata attributes comes from the Data One primer on, on data management, which I think is great. I, I'll give that as a reference at the end of this talk. And also let you know that on October 21st, uh, Susanna Sansoni from Oxford is going to give a talk on metadata and metadata standards, and I think that talk will be will really be very very helpful. Now I mentioned that not only do we want to understand the experiment in the metadata, we want to understand the parameters of the data. That may seem pretty trivial, but in fact, there's lots of evidence that shows that when we don't do that, we get into really big trouble. Uh, we certainly have good examples. We have trouble making sense of biomedical data. I think one of the best anecdotes is what happened uh, in 1998 when we sent the Mars Climate Orbiter to Mars. Uh, it's a great anecdote. I don't know, it's actually an unfortunate anecdote because it really was a $328 million disaster. As those of you who uh, may remember this, this, this adventure, uh, the manufacturers of the satellite uh, did their work correctly and followed the specifications and managed all their data using the metric system. But when NASA sent data up to the Mars Climate Orbiter, those data were sent uh, in the English system. And suddenly getting data in foot pounds was something that uh, really threw off the satellite and it, it crashed into the Martian surface. And the idea that NASA would not recognize that there needed to be unit conversion was obviously rather embarrassing and pro probably provides one of the best examples of why not only does our metadata need to describe what experiments we did, but also provide the data specific information that allows us to understand uh, what it is that uh, our, our, how our data are actually represented and what those, those various units are. So the metadata about the parameters will include how each parameter is measured or produced, what its units of measure are, uh, the formats used in the data set, the precision, accuracy, and uncertainty with which the data uh, uh, values are, are, are represented, uh, definitions of any codes that are used, what kinds of quality assurance was performed on the data, known problems that can limit the data use, and, and how to cite the data set. These are all things, of course, that we would like our metadata to say, and I guess one thing that I should be making very clear is that we often, actually, we usually don't have metadata that describe information at, at, at any of this level of, of, of detail. And of course, one of the goals of research in data science is to make it easier and better uh, for us to be able to make sure that our data are, are described at the right level of detail. So if we go to the gene expression omnibus, this is the place where we store all the uh, DNA microarray data that, uh, for example, Pradesh Country accesses. Uh, 
uh, one of the things that is, is, is very clear is that there is a template for how data in GEO need to be represented in the database. And this isn't just any old template created by NCBI. Basically, the framework for representing gene expression data in GEO stems from a description that is now almost uh, 16 years old called uh, the Minimum Information Standard about a microarray experiment, or Miami. And Miami basically represents the work of a community of investigators who got together and recognized that people were storing microarray data online, but they were doing it in a rather ad hoc fashion, and it was often impossible to look at the, the online data and understand how to make sense of the data that was stored there. And the community said, look, we're not waiting for some publisher or some sponsor to, to put the force this on us. We want to get together and come up with a minimal set of, of, of information uh, components that need to be described in order for us to understand what someone else may have done uh, with the gene microarray. And that means basically understanding what the raw data are, how the processing was done, uh, how the sample was annotated, and, and, and all the kinds of, of features that are critical in order to make sense of these kinds of data. And what's really very exciting is not only has uh, the micro uh, community created this kind of a standard, but lots of other groups have. If you go to biosharing.org, which Susanna Sansoni will be talking about uh, on uh, October 21st, you can find the Miami description online and a way of getting a good reference for what Miami looks like and knowing how to use Miami to describe micro information. But what's great, biosharing has information on hundreds of uh, different kinds of biomedical experiments. And so going to biosharing will allow you to find out information about how to represent metadata in a whole variety of community-blessed approaches. And it's really very exciting that, that I think the biomedical community is getting together and articulating uh, these kinds of frameworks. Um, and you'll hear a lot more about this in October when uh, Susanna gives her talk. And just to give a little bit of plug to my own work, I should say, in the CEDAR project that, that Phil mentioned, what we're doing in CEDAR is developing co computational methods for taking these kinds of standardized metadata templates that are already being promulgated by the community and putting them in a computational form that makes it really easy, we hope, uh, for investigators to fill out these checklists and, and templates and to create the kinds of robust and complete metadata that we think are going to be really, really important in order to ensure that the uh, uh, information that is stored in public repositories provides enough description so that people can find what they need and, and, and put it to use. Now you'll notice when we look at metadata templates, templates like this uh, cell line template from the Lynx uh, project that's in CEDAR, there are lots of blanks to get filled in, and one nominally could fill in these blanks just by typing in text of any kind. But one of the things that I think is really important uh, for creating metadata and something that the data science community recognizes increasingly is that we, what we really want to do is fill in those blanks with terms from standardized terminologies or ontologies. I don't have time this morning to talk about ontologies in any detail. Know that on October 7th, Michel de Moitier is going to give a whole talk on ontologies. This slide, which shows you a little snippet from the National Cancer Institute thesaurus, is one ontology that's become, become very important for cancer biology. And all of these hundreds of ontologies that are available in biomedicine provide controlled terms that make it possible for investigators to fill in blanks using terms that are precise, that have agreed upon meanings, and basically will be recognized for, what, for those meanings when people process the kinds of uh, metadata descriptions that we need in order to access metadata online. So we've planned our data management, we've collected our data, we've performed quality assurance, we've described our, our, our data using templates and ontologies. Now we have to preserve the data. We have to put the data on our own server, so to speak, in order to be able to use those data for our own analyses. And ultimately, we want to be able to preserve those data for the future so that others can access our data, make sense of those data, and do the kinds of experiments that country does. You would think putting data on a disk is not all that hard. You would think that knowing how to put data in a form where people can access it in a few days, in a few months, or a few years is not that difficult. But actually it requires a lot of planning and a lot of thought. 
and perhaps we can go back to the NASA example, since sometimes it's fun to pick on NASA, but certainly as someone who was very captivated myself by the space program and got so excited by what NASA was doing in the 1960s and 1970s, one of the, you know, the more famous stories to come out of that, that era concerns the fact that much of what came out of the Apollo program was captured in a variety of data formats ranging from uh, numerical data sets to video. Probably the video that we all remember the most is the, the video of Neil Armstrong when he first set foot on the moon. Uh, many of us watch this, these videos uh, with just absolute amazement to think that people were stepping on the lunar surface. Uh, what was interesting is that around 2006, there was suddenly a recognition that when you look at the still photos of people in mission control watching the astronauts on the lunar surface, at least the Apollo 11 mission, the photos, the videos weren't nearly this grainy and weren't nearly this bad. And in fact, when you look at the stills, you see that in real time, mission control was seeing phenomenal photos of, uh, uh, that were taken from the video available from the lunar surface, whereas those of us watching on TV saw these kinds of blurry images. And there was a great revelation that took place in Australia uh, where the original signals from the moon were collected in the Apollo 11 mission. And this article which appeared in the Sydney Morning Herald on October 7, 2006 describes what was pre uh, presented as one giant blunder for mankind. Because basically what happened in 1969 was that the really high density video image that came from the lunar surface uh, was stored in a particular format that got saved on magnetic tape. What the rest of us saw, uh, because that particular format was not something that could be broadcast internationally, was a, a monitor that was displaying the high quality image coming from the moon that was being filmed by a standard video camera so that the signal could be sent out in NTSC format to the rest of the broadcast world. And it is actually a video of that NTSC that we have preserved. And the original high quality video of Neil Armstrong stepping onto the moon was stored on a videotape. That sounds great until you hear that sometime in the 1970s, uh, NASA realized that it needed some more videotape and recorded over the original videotape that had the high quality transmission stored on it. And it's a sort of a, a really sad story of failing to have a data management plan, failing to recognize that this video might have lasting value to, the, to humanity, and that uh, uh, an expedient need to have a new, a new tape to co copy some new data on led to the loss of something which I think most people would view as uh, extremely important. And so it's just sort of a, a way of sort of making us all remember that media are critical, that the media that we use today to store our data may not be the media that we're using in 10 or 15 years. Um, and I think, I think we, of all of us who have been around long enough think about what kinds of data storage we had in the 1970s and 1980s, that's pretty clear. And there's also the issue of just what people have called bit rot, that uh, over time, uh, sometimes the way in which we store data, even digitally, leads to loss of information. And we have to recognize that we need copies and we need backups. And the good news is on September 30th, uh, uh, Pascal Godet was going to be talking about data curation and he'll talk a lot more about some of the physical problems of storing data and how to avoid some of these uh, really ugly, uh, ugly things. So life cycle involves planning, collection, QA, description, preservation, and then ultimately our goal is to discover. We want to be able to find the data that we need, not only for our own experiments, but also, as we've discussed already, uh, for other investigators to find our data and discover new kinds of things from those data. And so the good news is lots of work is taking place in the biomedical community in this area. Uh, we are no longer stuck in the, era, in the era of card catalogs. We have all kinds of technology, like the DataMed uh, system coming out of the BioCaddy community.
And so the good news is in this seminar series on uh, September 16th, Bill Hirsch will talk about general problems of information retrieval. And on September 23rd, Lucilla Ona Machado from UCSD, I'm sure, will talk about DataMed, the tool coming out of BioCaddy, which allows us to access data in a variety of repositories in a generic way and to search for data so that we can access the data we need and put, the, and put data together in, in ways which uh, I think will lead to new kinds of experimental insights. And so the data life cycle continues to circulate. We want to plan, we want to collect, we want to describe and preserve and discover and integrate. And frankly, we're in a stage where we are recognizing that this life cycle just circulates over and over and over again as data become available online and we can experiment with this data. And, and again, without even picking up a pipette, we can learn new things about biomedicine. And the, I think the, the buzzword that is now permeating uh, the community that you'll hear a lot about in upcoming talks is this notion of making data fair. The idea of that data should be findable, that it should be accessible, interoperable, and reusable. These uh, terms were, were came out of a workshop that took place in the Netherlands a couple of years ago, and now they're being adopted widely in the Elixir community in Europe, uh, in the BD2K community in the United States. And this notion of fair data, where it's possible to find data that may have been created by other investigators, where the data are accessible because they're stored in formats that we understand, that we can parse, and that we can interpret that they're interoperable because we can relate our data to the data that we have available online and make sense of a variety of data sets and we use those data to create new insights to identify as Katri did a genomic signature for sepsis or a genomic signature for active TB these are the kinds of experiments and the kinds of insights that are going to come from the data that we have online and frankly are going to increase the effectiveness of the biomedical enterprise by orders of magnitude because not only will we have the insights that come from the initial experiments, but we're going to be able to have tons of investigators who will be looking at existing data sets and coming up with insights that were just impossible to make at the time that the data were originally collected, either because the original investigators never thought of it, or because in retrospect we understand more about the world than we uh, may have understood previously and allow us to think about new kinds of analyses we can, we can perform and new kinds of investigations. That's why now, uh, 40, 50 years later, NASA is working really hard to figure out how it can try to recover many of the data sets that were created during the 1960s and stored on media that can no longer be read because the kinds of machines that read them no longer exist. Because now that we understand all that we've learned over the past 40 years, we want to go back to those data and reinterpret them. And that's exactly what's going to be happening in biomedicine as we try to go to old data sets that are available in the repositories that we manage throughout uh, the biomedical enterprise and start interpreting those data anew in terms of all the things that we'll learn in the interim. That's the very exciting part, and that's one of the reasons that having fair data is so important to us. Uh, there's also, if you will, a dark side that makes fair data just as important, and that is the increasing mistrust that people have had in science. Uh, people may remember the famous Economist uh, front page article that occurred about two or three years ago uh, discussing the problems that scientists have in being able to reproduce Was that a question? Okay. Uh, relating how, how Amgen uh, tried really hard to reproduce uh, the findings in 60, 63 landmark papers in cancer biology and claimed that they could only do so in about six of them. Uh, where Bayer tried to reproduce uh, 67 preclinical studies and said they were successful in validating the results in only 25%. The, the notion that many of these landmark studies that uh, ultimately may have been difficult to reproduce, spawned entire fields of investigation with no one bothering to confirm the initial results but taking them for granted and trying to do new experiments that basically allegedly would build on those uh, irreproducible results. And frankly, as many of us know, it is the non-reproducible studies that are more likely to get published in the journals that have the highest impact factors because often those non-reproducible studies 
frankly, have the most exciting results, even though it may be often difficult uh, in some cases to reproduce. And of course, this is a problem that's gotten a lot of hand wringing. Lots of people talk about it. It has lots of causes, um, and some of them are pretty trivial. Sometimes there's not enough statistical power in the study. Sometimes there's an art form in conducting the experiments, and the metadata themselves don't capture all that information. Um, there's often an eagerness to publish early or, or, or frankly prematurely. Rarely there's fraud, but really I think for many of us we have a, a problem where we have a system which traditionally has not made it easy or rewarding for investigators to replicate the results of other researchers. And we have a culture that is only now recognizing the importance of data preservation, description, and re-exploration. But as we pay more attention to the data lifecycle, as we think about how we can uh, use other people's data, how we can learn from other people's data, why it's important to revalidate other people's data, I, I honestly believe that the world is going to change. And at a minimum, we're going to see science moving uh, to a situation where we have even more open online access to experimental data sets where there's an emphasis on annotation of online data sets with adequate metadata uh, that not only will we try to have the minimal information about data available online, but I think ultimately we're going to see so much high quality metadata online that the online data may well, may, well, may well be just as useful as the journal publication in understanding what scientists have done and how to make sense of their work. There's increasing emphasis on the use of ontologies to be able to annotate metadata in a reproducible way. Um, and ultimately, as systems like data med lead to better search for, uh, uh, for experimental results, we're going to be able to find the data that we need and analyze them better. And fundamentally, what we're moving toward is a world where there's much more concern about data stewardship, and we recognize that the life cycle is really where, 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 it's, where we need to be focusing our attention. So ultimately, we're thinking about a, a revolution in the way we, we, we talk about science and the way we talk about data. We're going to be thinking about a world where invariably data are going to be coming at us with increasing volume, velocity, and variety. And as a consequence, the kinds of experiments that we do and the way that we manage our data are going to require lots of new computational approaches, new approaches that people are working on right now and that you'll learn about in this seminar series. We're recognizing that because data need to be validated and reinterpreted and re-explored, uh, investigators will no longer think of data as the side effect or the end product. Uh, that allows them to come up with the real result of the research, the scientific paper, but rather to treat the data as the actual purpose of the work and the data as the endpoint that is complemented by the scientific paper, but that also is going to provide the basis for future experimentation by a whole cadre of investigators who may not even have been born yet. And with the recognition that data should be fair, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, investigators will begin to need to plan for data management in much more comprehensive ways before they even begin their experiments, during their experiments as conditions change, and even after their experiments as they recognize that there may be better ways to make the data more publicly available so that other investigators can take advantage of the kinds of data that are being produced in the biomedical enterprise. So there's a life cycle that I've, I've mentioned, and if you think about the life cycle, not only does this provide a good framework for thinking about how data are collected and managed and used and discovered and, formed the, and used to form the basis of new experimentation, but basically what I think captures all of the main high points of data science that you'll hear about in this lecture series. And so the most important thing I can leave you with is that coming up are going to be some really fantastic talks by some really great people. And I hope that what I've said today will inspire you to tune in every week and hear about what is, what's going on on the cutting edge of data science and biomedicine. And let me leave you with a couple references that I think I found really useful uh, in thinking about some of the things I've talked about this morning, and hopefully you'll find valuable as you think about how you're going to be taking advantage of data management planning, thinking about the data lifecycle, and putting it to use in your own work.
let me stop there and let's see if we have uh, some time for some questions perhaps. So thank you, Mark. This is this is wonderful. Um, you gave a great overview of what we will um, see coming up, and um, I know I, for one, am really looking forward to this. Um, I um, think if there are any questions, we need to have them by the chat um, because everyone logged on in the silent mode. So if you do have a question, please just uh, write it in the chat box on the right-hand side of the control panel um, or on your control panel, wherever it is. And um, um, Dr. Mason might have a time for a couple of, to take a couple of questions. So there was one that came up earlier um, in the under the question box, and it's about um, fair data and interoperability. And it says, given the challenges with legacy data interoperability, for example, electronic health record limitations as far as exchanging data, will this lecture or future lecture discuss, or can you discuss, um, how to reconcile the need for open fair data and the underlying inter, uh, interoperability challenges. Mark, are you still there? Did I, did I get muted? I think you did get muted for, for a bit. Um, Am I back? You are back now, though, Mark. OK. I won't take it personally. Um, that was a great question. Uh, and it's more than I can answer in a couple of minutes. But I think there are problems that you point out because the way that we do experiments change over time. Uh, sometimes uh, I mean, we talk about microdata being reexamined. Well, obviously, the kinds of chips that people use change over time, and being able to go back and make sense of some of the very oldest technology is always challenging. Uh, a lot of the challenges occur because the way we think about the world changes. So I mentioned ontologies as being an important way to allow for interoperability among uh, heterogeneous data sets. But our ontologies themselves change over time. We know, for example, that data that were analyzed with old versions of the gene ontology will give results that are different from data that are analyzed with new versions of the gene ontology. And so uh, I don't want to say that we have a, a panacea for dealing with, with, with change over time in, in, in these experimental data sets, but we do have real opportunity for really exciting research in how to reconcile ontologies that change over time, how to ensure that data have sufficient annotation that we can go back and reconstruct what are all the assumptions that may be relevant in trying to integrate data that were created in, at, in, at different points in time under different circumstances, and recognizing that it's not just a matter of mixing and matching data sets, but there really is a science to being able to enumerate what are the assumptions behind data and to be able to reconcile for those assumptions as data get integrated. Thanks. The, there are quite a few other questions under the, um, the question box. Um, one of them that I see on the very bottom is, um, do you think that this data life cycle applies to all kinds of data other than my, biomedical data? Uh, yes, and I can say that uh, my first, uh, the first reference that you see on the screen now is one from the Data One community, which is uh, concerned with, with Earth sciences, and I think they represent a, uh, a different kind of community, but have exactly the same kinds of data needs and recognize exactly the same problems. I think that the issues that we're talking about relate to all of science, and I think they also result relate to data that are not necessarily created through controlled experimentation. I think they relate to observational studies as much as they do interventional studies. I think they relate to signal data that are acquired opportunistically, and I think to a certain degree they relate to the kind of data we get from EHRs. So I think uh, 
in, in a sense, all of these issues are relevant, and I think we're going to be seeing uh, persistence of data in all these forms and re-exploration of those data uh, from all those various sources uh, in the future. Okay, I think we have time for maybe one more question. Um, there's one here about data sharing. Um, and it says that there has been much progress in sharing molecular data, um, but there are challenges to clinical data, um, particularly challenges around privacy, consent, and other issues, um, and that investigators are hesitant to share the data. Um, do you foresee directions for tackling these challenges? Well, I think the, the, one of the biggest challenges in data sharing is the WIIFM problem. That's, that's not a radio station, it's what's in it for me. And I think investigators need to be able to understand that by making their data public, not only will they learn more because other people may have insights that they can contribute back, but also I think it's part, part of the scientific enterprise. And I think one of the things that is changing is a recognition that science doesn't stop with publication of a bunch of pros, but with the opportunity of others and the community at large to be able to look at data sets. That said, not only will people, I hope, act altruistically, but clearly funders are thinking about doing what they can to ensure that the data are made available. And the basic sentiment is that data that are collected as a consequence of public investment and research belong to the public and therefore need to be made available. That is obviously going to be different in the case of EHR data, which have a different, uh, different value. But at the same time, I think patients who recognize that the learning health system as a model is going to be making medical care better and more precise in the future, also recognize that they may want to make their data available even if their providers may not, because those data will ensure that the care of future patients may be more refined. And so I think a lot of this depends on cultural change and the recognition among investigators that data sharing is important, and also when it comes to clinical data, a recognition on the part of patients that they can help humanity by making their data available as well. So thank you so much, Mark. Um, I think the uh, if, if Jack would like to say the last few words, um, I am not sure they are are able to, I think their, their audio cut out, but um, if, uh, if, unless they want to jump on, I think we should uh, just say thank you to our speaker, which I think everyone will be, is giving you a silent applause right now, Mark. Um, and, but then also thank you to everyone who joined in. Sorry about the, um, the slow start this morning. We will be sending out again the the new URL, um, and I, I particularly want to thank the Training Coordination Center for, um, at the last minute, switching over to a service that will accommodate all, all of us. Um, so thank you very much, and I hope that you all tune in in the, next, in the up upcoming weeks, because we have a great program ahead of us. Bye now. <laughs>